Greetings once again. Oh, boy. What a weekend. What a whirlwind. Um, you know, I kind of surge in, uh, in uh, the, um, you know, content that I produce for the web and uh, for the Lord. And I just want to say over these last years, since really 2002, I have, uh, you know, found that I, I had a life, you know, serving you. You know, serving the Lord, serving you at when I had no life before, when the gang stalkers had in L.A. had pretty much stripped me of everything and were just ready to do me in like everybody else. And last night I recalled a gang stalking incident that and this will and, and what you know, I understand there are T.I.'s out there that do that don't know the Lord, don't do spiritual warfare. I understand that. Fine. But listen to this. Listen to this. So for me, if I give my testimony, you realize I didn't have any other choice. There was just no other way for me to fight it. I could not. There were no networks back then. There were no help groups back then. Okay. The who's going to help me when I'm in a coma in the Denver General Hospital when I'm 18 years old. Uh, put there by gang stalkers. Gang stalking is as old as time. Okay. It's as old as time. You know, because they've gotten sophisticated with satellites and all that. It all comes from a demonic spirit. But so anyway, I had this, we had this friend and she got away from her husband and moved into um, a, an apartment and moved to another town, okay, in San Diego. And feeling she would be getting away from all the oppression. And uh, she had been like a greeter, I think, at Sam's Club and, you know, she had a daughter, a young daughter, you know, 12, 13-year-old daughter. And uh, they were going to start out a new life in an apartment in San Diego. And no sooner did she get there that, um, you know, items of their underwear were st stolen. Um, locks were changed. Things were moved around, taken out of the apartment, then put back into the apartment. Um, you know, surveillance equipment had been, you know, put in or she felt she was being surveilled with wires. It was really freaking her out. And eventually she got a cut and she went to have it treated and it turned into a skin uh, eating, a uh, flesh eating disease. And she went to the hospital and every move they made in the hospital got worse and worse. She felt that they in the hospital were part of the game, part of the stocking. Okay. And, um, you know, and, and she felt the motive was that they wanted to rape her daughter, okay, who was like 12 or 13. That was one of the motives. But then there was also the motive of death. And I know a lot of you out there don't understand the motive of death where someone actually wants to do you in, to kill you. Well, she got this flesh-eating disease. I believe it was in the hospital. What, what began as just a, an infection turned into a flesh-eating disease in the hospital. And it was felt that someone gave that to her. Someone infected her on purpose. And then she died. Okay. Her daughter, um, you know, the, the, the game had a beginning, middle, and end. In other words, they, they, they came to her apartment. They, they, they messed with her car. They messed with the apartment. They broke into the apartment. They took things out of the apartment. They put things back in. She was freaking out. She got a cut on her leg. She went to the hospital. She felt they were part of the same game. It became flesh eating disease in the hospital. And then shortly thereafter, she died. Beginning, middle, and end. Her daughter was then either went to live back with the husband or um, went to live. No? She went to live with a different family after that. And then we had offered even to, to, to take her in if she needed a place, if she needed a, a family. Um, okay, that was right around 2004. Three or four. Now that's more typical to my experience. And I was on the ropes too in Los Angeles, where I was about one click away from death. There were uh, trucks going by. I was being uh, followed. Um, there were there were vans that were going by with cages in them, which I felt like uh, you know I'm not going to be too close to the curb because I don't want to wind up there. Uh, there were people at a church that were trying to get me to go with them. And my friend said, if you jump in the car with them, you'll, you'll wind up uh, in a hole in the desert, you know? And it's like, really church people, you mean like Calvary chapel people would do that to you? Yep. 
and brought him down there to have him check the people out. Yep. And they're part of the larger church network. So this gang stalking is going on in churches. Okay. And, um, they did threaten my life and, uh, they did, uh, threaten to put, to, um, you know, pull the switch on me. I was threatened at the church with, they did threaten me with murder at the church of Chuck Smith. Okay. Um, I did complain. I think I wrote an email into the headquarters in uh, Costa Mesa. They didn't bat an eye. <laughs> did not bat an eye. So there was no help there. I finally went to another guy in California and I told them what had been happening at the church. I told them that, the, you know, they were coming into the house and they were following me and, you know, and then other people were following me and there was just this horrible kind of time I went through. And he said, it sounds to me like you've stumbled onto a satanic cult not a, uh, this is not a legitimate church group. We had figured out they've been doing rituals on, on late on Sunday nights on full moon. They've been having like rituals where they have garbage and blue bags that needs to be taken out and, and they don't want anyone to touch those bags so that, you know, then where they produce all those garbage and blue bags, it was on Sunday night, the middle of the night. So once we put that together, then our lives were in danger. We had to get out of there. So, Okay, so organized stalking was occurring there. Uh, it occurred to my friend there, and then and then and then in L.A. in general around my home, um, you know, the same thing: people coming in, uh, surveilling equipment, cameras, people across the street with infrared looking into our house. Where we caught them with the infrared with something from the like the CIA. The guy said he was in the CIA or he said he was in the government or something. He had infrared and cameras on top of his house that he would hide during the day. But we saw them. So he's surveilling us with infrared from across the street. He happened to be the uh, the czar of drugs. He was in charge of all the drugs coming in. He was a Pakistani guy who was an American citizen who was also used in the talks with Pakistan. So he was kind of heavily connected and way up in the government. OK, Um you know, a bureaucrat, but with a very cushy little job. And um, he was surveilling us, and other people were, and he told me not, don't mind them. You know, we, the guy, you know, many people survey. So the whole, the whole neighborhood became like gang stalking. And like I say, they would break in when we're gone, and when we're back, they're there. They, you know, um, this happened also in, uh, in the 90s. It happened when we lived in uh, Malibu. There was recording equipment that was put in the... Uh, because I said something, and the guy that put the equipment there, though, he answered me as if answering the thing I was saying that he picked up on the mic on the recording equipment. So then there we were uh, also. And it's been going on, you know, constantly. It, here it's a little more difficult because uh, they come out here like they'll move here. They'll spend tens of thousands of dollars, you know, to rent a nice house and, you know, to become friends and all that. There's that kind of theater that goes on, Okay. So there's, and it's been on many, many, many different levels. I mean, they, they, uh, it, it just, it, it's been almost nonstop since I was a child. The only way that I survived and I survive is through my faith and Yeshua and holy angels around me that, that are my guardians. I've had to rely on prayer heavily, heavily to get through this whole thing. And, um, even when I was poisoned and, um, and other things that I didn't, I did, I got symptoms, I got handicapped in a way, but I didn't die. I got a thorn in my side, like in the form of an ulcer, but I didn't die. You know, that was supposed to take me out. So it's been, you know, and then I asked people that were significant others about it and they said, um, and then when move, when I moved into the desert, they said, well, you'll be safe there. In other words, they too, my significant others, people around me, people in my family, they were in on it too, doing this to their own flat, their own kin. I didn't get to the point of thinking it was, you know, everyone, but when I saw the neighborhood I was in, it was everyone in that neighborhood pretty much. It was sort of like being in the in the movie Rosemary's Baby Forever with a No Way Out. 
you know, is you go try to complain to somebody and they're in on it too. And they just make a phone call and they call back to, you know, so it's this vast network of people that ought to be killed, quite frankly, you know, that, that, uh, I believe Yahweh will take them out in some way. I mean, once it gets to a certain level where it's so saturated that it's just basically them, the Lord will take them out. They may make no mistake. There will be no legacy. Their children will not go on and have children. It will be over for them. But what are they? Who are the gang stalkers? The gang stalkers are, number one, they are Satanists. Hardcore Satanists. Ruled by hardcore Satanists. Not every one of them participates in rituals. But they're all part of that network because it has to be a psychical network. It's not just cell phones and satellites. It's not just computer surveillance. It's not just breaking into your house and doing street theater where they, where they, they, they come to a restaurant. See, they want you to think it's everybody. So they'll be in a restaurant and sidle up next to you. This happened to me several times, many times in a bar where they'll start talking trash, you know, right next to me and make me think that the whole restaurant's against me. I remember when I, I had to flee from this one restaurant because it was getting dangerous. You know, I fled. And as I was leaving, there's a guy outside that goes, Elvis has left the building, you know? So they were all just waiting for that one. How are they ahead of you in time where they know where you're going to be? How were they ahead of me in time when I went to Maui to a uh, restaurant next to the hotel I was staying in there for a writer's conference? And I went to this restaurant and we had to wait at the bar for the table to, to, to be ready. So I go up to the bar and ask for a drink, and the guy goes, we know who you are. And then there were people taking pictures of me, following me around the island taking pictures. How does that happen? Well, you could say, okay, they surveilled you. They knew you were going to go to Hawaii. 